We've officially made it to the end of season one of The Secrets of the Silver City. So a massive congratulations to all of the crew for making it this far. And of course, many thanks to all of our listeners for following and supporting us on our journey. After 118 episodes and two and a half years, I think a recap is in order to remind us all of key locations, notable NPCs and the story so far. Without further ado, let's dive in. Following Avacyn's imprisonment inside the Hell Vault, one of her most devout Cathars, the genius Katarina Brunn, was tasked with the investigation of a magical object, the Stryonic Resonator, that was believed to be key to the release of Avacyn from her internment. Katarina was able to discover much about the artifact and wrote her notes in a unique cipher to guard her knowledge from all. When the church lost contact with Katarina, investigations were held. Katarina was never found. However, her notes and the artifact were recovered and brought into the possession of the Lunarch, Micaeus. Wary of the gaze of the Skirzdag cultists who have pervaded even the church itself, Micaeus tasked a promising young Cathar, Cuin de Greymont, with a mission of utmost secrecy and importance. Cuin was to gather a team of trustworthy, powerful individuals and decipher Katarina's notes. At the start of our adventure, we met Cuin, the party paladin hailing from Thraben, the seat of Innistrad's power in the province of Gavney. He was travelling with Ogvar Shawfort, his longtime friend and rugged ranger, whose origins lay in the thick, autumnally hued forests of the southern central province of Keswick. Both were travelling east into the province of Nefalia, towards the small fortified town of Gloomrest, attempting to intercept a sorceress, Elora Greyvale, upon the recommendation of Casper de Greymont, Cuin's elder brother. Elora herself was on a mission. Hailing from the port city of Havengal in the north of Nefalia, she was under the employ of Casper and had been tasked by him to deliver a package to the renowned Cracked Acorn Inn. Intercepting Elora at the gates of Gloomrest, introductions were made, and after proof of identity was shown in the form of a shiny seal, Elora agreed to join Cuin and Ogvar on their holy quest after the completion of her current task. The small town of Gloomrest boasts one of Innistrad's most iconic establishments, the Cracked Acorn Inn. Built around a towering ancient oak and filled with exquisite carvings, the inn is run by one Evit Hallowstrike, an NPC that still has Sam grinding her teeth until this day. Gloomrest was an ideal sandbox for the crew to acquaint themselves with the mechanics of D&D, making skill checks and dodgy deals, spiking drinks, buying novelty mugs and being knocked unconscious by an angry wolf were just some of the character-building activities that took place. With Alora's task completed, the trio of adventurers left the fortified town, only to encounter a group of evil Skirstag cultists. Battle ensued, and the skirmish with the Skirstag concluded with their foes defeated, and only one casualty, an unfortunate town guard. Continuing with their trip down the Nefalian coast, towards the city of Junau, the trio had several strange experiences, from violent venison and pop-up spits, to the almost unheard of instance of planar interference, as the Shadowfell briefly crossed with Innistrad, producing an eerie scenario that was as rewarding as it was chilling. Elora, Ogvar and Cuin eventually made their way to the city of Junau, one of Nefalia's three main port cities. Snuggled into the curve of the Bay of Vustro, Junau is a sprawling city featuring large noble mansions, shops of all description, warehouses and industrial districts, and a vast sea of shanty buildings near the docks. The main feature is a large promontory that hosts several official buildings, and sat atop the pinnacle plateau, a beautiful church. Junau is a bustling city, and the first location that may proffer clues to decoding Katarina's cipher. Upon entry, the trio took a brief rest to recuperate from their eventful journey from Gloomrest, before starting their investigations. A trip to a bookshop, the Spy Mine, created a connection with the proprietress, Zofia Softblaze, who provided a useful lead, 
alongside several paper cuts as the party received a bibliographic battering from some errantly enchanted tomes. Following Zafir's advice, the group visited a local apothecary, the File of Moonlight, where Karina, an old friend of Katerina, resided. Karina was able to give the group further insight into Katerina's education, pointing them towards two individuals, Jenrik, Katerina's teacher, who leads a solitary life in the southeastern region of the plain in a tower, and Hans Reinhardt, Katerina's uncle and a renowned astronomer who resides in the southern central hinterland region of Kessig. The three were also gifted a potion each, a potion of dire situation, which is yet to feature in any episode. With this new information in hand, the party's plans were rapidly foiled by foul weather blowing inshore. What appeared to initially be only a bad storm soon turned the sky into a bubbling, broiling cauldron that sent Alora, Ogvar and Kuin scrambling for shelter. As the trio made a mad dash for the welcoming embrace of Avacyn's church, Streaks of lightning illuminated peculiar faces in the bank of fog clouds rolling over the waves that rapidly disappeared as if only an illusion. Sprinting up the promontory towards the large oaken doors, the weather was rapidly deteriorating, with the wind screaming, waves pounding the docks, ships being tossed around in the harbour, and pelting rain stinging any and all exposed flesh. It was a relief for the group to see a solitary figure encouraging them into the stony warmth of Avison's halls. Here, the party met the enigmatic Esther Aziz, a surprisingly spry elder Cathar who had been charged with the custodial duty of the Junau Church, having retired as a member of the elite holy group known as the Order of the Midnight Duelists. Esther took our adventures under her wing, providing them with ample hospitality and shelter from the vicious nebelgast that now flooded the streets with agitated apparitions. The party soon had the opportunity to repay Esther's kindness. Amidst her recounting of tales of victory, the evening's unholy phenomenon had produced a peculiar effect upon the corpses sheltered in the church's catacombs breathing unlife into the husks and creating cruel undead enemies that had burst from their coffins. Battle soon ensued and the undead were soon laid to rest once again. With group agreement that any catacomb capers should be left until the morning, Esther, Elora, Kuin and Ogvar set to work barricading the crypt door, ensuring no further undead incursion. Dawn saw the dissipation of the unnatural Nebelgast, and delving into the depths of the catacombs, Kuin had the misfortune of receiving a misfired spell to the face that left him positively beaming, and Colin temporarily multiclassing into a bard. Despite the ferocity of their foes, Elora, Esther, Ogvar and Kuin were able to smash, shoot and spell their way to victory. With Esther remaining behind to commence the clean-up operation, the trio descended to the second subterranean floor. Here, the party had the further misfortune of meeting a massive amalgamation of limbs, a large creature formed from the fusion of flesh into an unholy horror, known as the Unholy Saint. Further exploration beneath the church revealed an altar room. Here, a shining sigil gave each of our adventurers a unique experience, and left them inheriting bloodline legacies and a lot of loot. Returning to the main body of the church, our trio encountered several new characters. Robert, Callie, and Florent, Esther's grandson. Florent thanked the party for aiding his grandmother with a most generous gift, Orland, the sentient haversack. The chatty bag was emptied of all foul contents, with dirty boots being disposed of and soiled skidders being fired from the promontory by their elastics. After a heartfelt conversation about her future, and with Florent taking custody of the church, Esther decided to join the party for one last grand adventure across the plain. With the blessed building returned to order, Elora, Ogvar and Kuin decided to do a spot of loot liquidation, travelling around the various shops. But bartering is thirsty work, and soon enough it was time for a spot of drink in the Junau branch of Contract Valor, the famed mercenary guild. Over their ales, the three mulled over the benefits of joining the organisation, and soon the chance of coin won over. Now a part of the prestigious group, 
a recommendation from a stranger who introduced himself as Sato, a travelling merchant and information broker, led the group to undertake their first contract. Travelling to the overstated Ballantyne estate, the trio met Emmanuel Enoch Ballantyne, a local lord who was more pig-like than the creature he was eagerly consuming. The task was seemingly simple. Trim the topiaries. However, these bushes had a mind of their own. Designed to guard the gardens of affluent households, these spelled shrubs required a delicate touch that the blundering sorceress struggled to provide. Trees trimmed, the group had just enough time to undertake another task before returning to the guild to discuss their nighttime plans. Inviting Esther out for an evening of entertainment, the group made their way down to the underground arena. The cavern was a sight to behold. A large arena was suspended over the city's sister, overlooked by a myriad of colourfully clad platforms that lined the walls, with vibrant braziers and lamps providing hued illumination that added to the atmosphere. The group spent some time wandering the walkways and absorbing the sights before the call of combat became too much for Kieran to bear. After getting to grips with a guy with a greasy great club, Kieran enticed Ogfar into a beastly battle that was certainly no bore. A mysterious man soon came calling for Esther. The enigmatic Ryko rapidly revealed himself to be not so human, seeking the elder Cathar on behalf of the Stormcloak vampire clan. A delicate balance has been maintained over the years between the Stormcloaks and Church, and now, with Florent taking the mantle from Esther, old alliances must be fortified as a formality. Riker, fighting on behalf of Runo, the clan patriarch, engaged Esther in a duel. Moving faster than the eye could see, the battle was over in a blink, with Esther standing victorious over the vamp. Political formalities finalised, Florence's position within Junau was secured for the foreseeable. After such an eventful evening, Elora, Ogvar and Kieran returned to their lodgings at the Guild. The next morning saw a cheerful Esther introducing the group to two new people. Having met the cleric Caddo Chasseur and fighter Gala Booth as they delivered Florent, Robert and Callie's goods and supplies, Esther had seen their potential and determined that they may be able to assist Kieran on his holy mission. In order to test Caddo and Gala's skills, a quest was chosen, and soon enough the six found themselves at sea, paddling towards Junau's lighthouse. Traversing over a raggedy rope bridge, the crew were able to find an underground goods entrance, only accessible by a perilous path. The dank, dark tunnel led to a storeroom, where a suspicious puddle of liquid quickly turned into transparent trouble as combat commenced with the gelatinous cube. Making their way up the inside of the lighthouse, traps, trickery and trouble were in store, as once again the group engaged with Skirsdag cultists. Soon, they could travel no further, as inky blackness, impenetrable by light, blocked the path. The six ruminated for a while before the decision was taken out of their hands and they were dragged into the darkness. As the darkness receded, they found themselves in a cavern surrounded by chanting and whispers, from which emerged a formidable foe. Dismissing the six as threats, a summoned serpent was set upon the party. The battle was tough, but the giant snake was defeated at last. However, Gala, who had taken heavy hits in the fray and gone down, could not be found once the shadows had receded. Exiting the ritualistic chamber, the five emerged into a misty marshland, quickly identified as the Drunken Mire, a marshy area of land seldom explored that lay several days to the southwest of Junau. Here, the group had many strange and hostile encounters on their journey back, including meeting the marvellous mycologist, Professor Portia Bello, who was amorous to our archer, making wistful wishes in forgotten fountains, and hiding from a hydra. The journey back took many days, but soon they were in the city, and with Caddo on board, making preparations to journey to Genmix via the southernmost Nephalian city of Selhof. Such preparations included the selection of en route quests to accumulate some cash, and the group were fortunate that there was a wagon escort request that would take them to their next city, cutting their travel time down by several days. 
The next morning saw the group gathering at the gate, where they met the merchant, Leopold Lemur, and his reliant crew, Big John, Ricky, Ben, and Jeff. The jovial Leopold specialised in apothecary supplies, and his return journey to Selhof would see the wagon train pass through the small town of Ironford, where Laura had shrewdly picked up a request to subjugate a troublesome troll. Once at Ironfort, with goods gathered and the party returning with their foul-smelling foe's head, the wagon set off once again on the road to Selhof. However, it wasn't much longer until further trouble occurred. Cresting over the top of a wooded hill, the glorious Ospid River came into sight. This fast-flowing, wide water feature completely blocked the path ahead, traversable only by ferry. This natural obstruction had necessitated the formation of a small settlement named Ospid Point that catered to travellers as they waited for transport across. After evening meals where only chicken was on the menu, the party was rudely awoken early in the morning as bells told the tale of the ferry's imminent arrival. Here it was a case of all hands on deck as fellow travellers rushed to get their affairs in order and line up for boarding. The journey across was not smooth sailing. The rapidly flowing waters soon became disturbed as a fluid figure rose out of the depths, towering above the boat. A water elemental now threatened everyone's safety. Stuck halfway across the river, the passengers had no choice but to fight nature itself or face a watery grave. Washed out, half drowned, and soaked to the bone, the party managed to defeat the elemental, with some assistance from the other passengers who, admittedly, thanks to some very poor roles, had spent most of their time sliding around the deck. Caddo, who had proven to be a most devout and hungry Cathar, immediately started a whip round to thank Avacyn for her holy grace that turned out to be most profitable, even if the glass eye was a bit odd. With the journey now proceeding as planned once again, the crew were able to disembark and continue their travel towards the city. Now with two new individuals in tow, Arvis and Mr Marks, who had both suffered losses via the watery foe. The city of Selhof was a sight to behold. Crammed into a steep-sided valley, this city almost flowed down the hillside. Larger mansions higher up, transitioning to smaller buildings in the middle and slum-like areas nearer the port. Many tall spires punctuated the skyline, each displaying banners decorated with noble crests. Leading them into the city, the wagons proceeded through the shopping districts before Leopold helpfully dropped the party off at the guild to submit their quests. Wishing them well on their journeys, Leopold left them with a glowing review and headed to his warehouse. Submitting their completed quests and disposing of the rapidly rotting troll's head that somehow smelt worse now than the creature did before, the group engaged in a brief spot of shopping to pick up essential supplies and sell surplus goods, leaving Esther in the bar with Arvis. Kieran and Caddo headed to the church to speak to the bishop, Gerhard Hermann, and proffer their collected offerings to Avacyn. The bishop was sceptical of their purpose in travelling south, and after spluttered half-truths, the bishop declared that he knew of the mission that Kewin had been set. Gerhardt revealed that the power of Selhof's cathedral was waning, and that Arthur Axum, the city lord, was the cause of political corruption and sought to diminish the church's influence. Gerhardt inferred that there had been trespassers within the vaults, and that, should the party assist, they would be rewarded by the church for their aid. Also inferred was that Kewin may discover further information to support his holy mission by heading underground. With their activities done, our characters returned to the guild, only to find Esther and Arvis several sheets to the wind. It turns out that the Shirley Avacins were very easy on the palate, and unlike Arvis, Esther had an astonishing alcohol tolerance. Okvar and Alora struggled to get Arvis to bed and luck was not on their side as their newfound friend emptied her stomach on the staircase. With little to do, Elora made some inquiries about any evening entertainment on offer. She was given a rather cryptic clue, and it was soon decided that they would wait until night had set to explore Selhof's underground arena. Soon enough, the group, Sans Arbis, set out to follow the clues to the illicit arena. 
On the way, they were cautioned by an old crone about the sewer stench, and she quickly touted her wares. Pegs, hankies, and suspicious brews were all up for offer. Ogvar, who declined purchasing any of her products, was left to produce a classic pavement pizza, as the stench soon overwhelmed his senses. The arena was a bustling place, and after a banging night in the bowels of the city, involving exploding lettuce, a local wielding a testy trident, a snappy that was not so happy, a spot of lucky lockpicking, and some rather racy rodents, the party returned to the guild for a nightcap. A decision was made to visit the cathedral the next day, where the rest of the group met the venerable bishop and his cathar slash caretaker, Ruth. The team dived into the vault, exploring every nook and cranny for clues as to where, how, and why the church's valuables had been taken. Carefully checking the walls revealed a hidden door, behind which was a trap that struck Kewin straight in the sternum. With the trap now disabled, the group were able to see a short passage with a large hole in the floor, beneath which there was a clever mine track system set up. After a brief discussion, minecart mayhem ensued. Kado and Kewin were the first to tackle the twisting track, with Alora, Ogvar and Esther following behind. The minecart ride had seen the party rapidly descending, and upon disembarking they found themselves in a narrow passageway. Investigation by Ogvar on some suspicious footprints revealed that the thieves may not be as human as the party thought. With the way ahead blocked, a potion of gaseous form was put to good use by Kewin. In his new gassy state, he was able to slip through the cracks in the planks and return to solid form inside the room. Now back to full tangibility, he was able to move the blockage, allowing Ogvar, Elora, Kado and Esther through. In the dank room, several discoveries were made. Bones belonging to children were scattered around, with clear gnaw marks carved into the calcium, and a suspiciously pristine letter contained clear evidence of the city lord's involvement in the affair. In Esther's anger, she broke open one of the crates stacked in the room. The contents which spilled from within were clearly some of the missing artefacts. From this evidence, the party concluded that the non-human thieves were surely evil, and the city lord would have been well aware of their wrongdoings. Returning to the church, the party informed Gerhardt and Ruth of their discoveries, and quickly began to plan an infiltration mission into the city lord's residence to recover the missing valuables and attain further evidence of Axum's evil deeds. Here, the group were given full access to all of the church's resources and cathars, and various surveillance, resourcing and preparation tasks were soon distributed for completion. The team themselves undertook several tasks, and Ogvar, Kewin and Kado found themselves attempting to relieve the barracks of some uniform sets that would come in handy as disguises. They were interrupted in their attempt by the boisterous Jerome van der Tack, the captain of the city guard and his continuous recollection of the Battle of Dryfish Dock. With all preparation completed, all that was left was to wait for the ideal time to start the infiltration. The group were able to sneak through a sewer passage that led into a disused fountain within the grounds of the Axum estate, and with Colby, the explosive expert, providing ample distraction while the city lord's party took place, the group were able to make the mad dash across the open grassland to the back terrace of the mansion. An overly successful attempt to silence a guard saw Kewin breaking the man's neck, but the group were able to access the library without detection. Heading upstairs into Axum's private office, a suspiciously magical chess set piqued Caddo and Alora's interest, and interactions with it saw the animation of a large suit of armour. Combat was tough, and poor Ogvar was thrown through the window and out into the night. When the foe was finally defeated, Elora's investigations proved fruitful, and putting the king in check caused a hidden door to spring open. Here, the group were able to recover all of the church's missing artefacts. Not without losing a few eyebrows, though. 
A bedazzled chest proved to be more monstrous than expected, battering Elora and leaving her briefly unconscious. However, the party's luck was not to last, as someone came to investigate the ruckus. As Elora attempted to remove a rather luxurious rug, she revealed a symbol nobody wanted to see. The symbol of Skursdag was carved directly into the floor, further proving Axum's evil doings. Returning to the church with the recovered valuables, the Cathars, Ruth and Gerhard, were besides themselves with glee, and quickly enough celebrations were held. Riding high off the success of the heist, the party dragged on late into the night, and it wasn't until the next morning that the consequences would be seen. The following day, as Ogvar left the building, he received a nasty surprise in the form of an arrow. Quickly returning to the safety of the church, he received medical attention as, from the back door, Colbin received a similar gift to the thigh. Ogvar's arrow had been sent with a threatening message tied to the shaft, and soon enough it was all hands on deck as the church locked down in preparation of a siege. The siege was a tough fight for the crew, with catapults involved in a frontal assault, a flanking assault over the back walls and into the garden, and a subtle infiltration using the hidden passage in the basement, revealing the thieves to be a trio of were-rats. The battle raged on, and although the defence was holding strong, a timely intervention from defensive reinforcements from Thraben, led by the enigmatic Armin Ducasse, was key in overwhelming the attackers. From their time in Selhof, the party had forged new friendships, and, as promised by Gerhardt, they received a pick of the recovered magical items as a reward. Here, we left Caddo. Spencer, staying true to what his character would do, decided to stay in Selhof and aid the church in regaining order and re-establishing faith. The well-loved cleric was last seen as the party left the city gates, whipping some lazy guards into shape. The journey south to Jemrick's tower was made far easier with the acquisition of a wagon and team of horses that allowed the party to move faster and maintain their energy. It was on a rough path, clearly rarely used, that the group encountered a young child who had been taken from her village alongside her brother and kept in captivity. The girl, Ivona, pleaded with the party for help, and being the heroes that they are, they readily agreed to rescue her brother. Following her information, Ogvar, Kuin, and Delora mounted their horses, leaving Esther to guard the wagon and girl, and headed into the woods in search of the cave. Soon it was in sight. The remnants of a sacred burial place left unsealed had been sullied by evil's influence. Inside, the trio found the missing boy, badly wounded and in need of aid, an elderly man who breathed his last in Kuin's arms, and they were then attacked by their captor, a vampire spawn. Purging the sight of its unholy presence, the group then rushed to get the boy to safety. Ivona and her brother were from a small settlement called Stagwick, which just so happened to be the subject of a contract that Alora had picked up from Selhoff's branch of the Mercenary Guild. There had been reports of slaughtered animals drained of all blood. Coincidence? Or a related occurrence? Arriving at the small town, the party were gifted free food and board for the return of the children, and after some rest and recuperation, the group started investigations into the mummified animals. Small clues were found, but it was the recounting of the tale of Stonewall Hall that truly piqued Alora's interest. By unanimous decision, the party decided to explore the abandoned building, hoping to resolve the local myth. Here, they found yet more links to the Skirsdag cult. Surprising them all was the appearance of a rather dishevelled man. Introducing himself as Otto, the man revealed that he was in search of our very own Ogvar. Even he didn't know why, but the land had been guiding him towards Ogvar from within his dreams. Elora was rightfully suspicious of his sudden appearance, but the following events were to prove his allegiance. In the basement, they discovered the perpetrator of the previous residents' disappearances. The butler, 
as pictured in the servants' quarters, had remained unchanged by time, his vampiric nature excluding him from the effects of ageing. After a brutal battle that saw friends turn to foe, the vamp was vanquished, and all that was left was for the party to explore the upper floors of the ruined mansion. It was here that they found various magical artefacts, alongside a battered journal, the contents of which were disturbing to say the very least. It appeared that this small book documented the butler's spiral into madness, in places appearing to be written in blood. Taking the book with them as evidence for the Mayor of Stagwick, the last stop before they returned was in the rear courtyard. All of the crew had an ominous feeling about the stone well that had been blocked off with a large boulder. Utilising the strength of Otto's companion, Bojo, and his own druidic wild shaping powers, the stone was removed from the wooden planks covering the well. Those two were removed, and before all of the party's eyes, six glowing orbs floated from the well's depths and disappeared into the sky as the souls of those killed within the house were returned to Avacyn's embrace. As a final act of remembrance and to preserve their bodies, Otto used a spell to create a solid stone covering, encapsulating the corpses within the well forevermore. Returning to the Heart and Hearth, Stagwick's Tavern, the party told the tale of Stonewell Hall in its entirety, bringing the mystery to a close. With their job in the town now completed, the party decided to depart once they had completed their various miscellaneous tasks. Leaving was hard. Ivona was in tears as she said farewell to Ogvar, with whom she had grown close. But the entire town gathered together to say goodbye to our heroes, as they set off on the road to Jenrick's Tower. In much the same way that this was intended to be a short 10 episode podcast that would allow the crew and myself to acquaint or reacquaint ourselves with Dungeons and Dragons, this brief recap has turned into a seven page saga. That being said, there are many moments omitted from this summary, from moments of absolute hilarity that had us rolling on the floor to individual battles that the party faced on their journey. From releasing the very first episode on July the 18th, 2021, we have grown so much as a team. Adding Spencer with his witty one-liners and Rick with his extensive knowledge of RPGs, I am truly grateful to the crew for making this podcast and game as beautiful as it is. We still have a lot of the adventure to go, so at 118 episodes we are calling this the end of Season 1. Season 2 is well underway, and we will be releasing the first episode next weekend, where the party commence their journey to Jenrick's Tower. 